All right, let's get started. We have two very interesting speakers with us tonight, Nick Terry and Jane Wynn, who... Tonight? Today, tomorrow morning. <laughs> I'm here, I'm here. Um, and uh, if you haven't noticed, I certainly have, uh, that there's, there's, a, there's a bit of a theme running here about the change that is coming upon not just uh, commerce, not just the economy, not just higher education, but eventually and inevitably legal education. And I'm taking away from this that we have a responsibility as the people who hear about it first. We're the, uh, we're the FEMA for our law schools, the Federal Emergency uh, Management Association or Assistance, whatever it is. Um, we're the ones that sound the sirens, or at least we're the ones that say, you know, here's how we're going to deal with these issues. And so I hope you find great insights in what they have to say. And let's roll. Nick? Thank you. Let the record show it's six minutes past. <laughs> Good morning. And a particular thank you. The, 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 both, they obviously brought extra caffeinated coffee, John. Uh, and a special greetings to uh, the, the geeks in C50, uh, having the true distance experience out there. Um, this is a unique group, uh, one very close to my heart. Uh, I, I look out and I see visionaries, I see missionaries, and, and I see Tom Bruce. <laughs> In our very diverse ways, we're the go-to guys on this. We're the, implement the implementers. We're the ones that are being challenged by our institutions to come up with the distance learning strategies. And when we look for guidance, I think where we go originally is to that relatively thin slice of e-commerce as we know it. And we look to Amazon. And I'll answer the question for you. Most of us see in Amazon far greater value than anything in bricks and mortar bookstores. And those of us who are not relying solely on the vagaries of our TIA craft statements. <laughs> Maybe we're more split as to the relative value proposition of an E-Trade against a full service breaker, price aside. And then we look at Concord. And everyone in this room, I would suggest, would say that today, our law school offers better value, there's a better value proposition than Concord. And yet every one in this room, I would suggest, does not really have an answer for that value proposition conundrum a year out, three years out, five years out. Now in cyberpunk Chinatown, Jack Nicholson, here playing Jack Getz, no doubt would be met by the gentleman from the ABA Water Company. And as it says in the cartoon, know what we do with noisy little creeps with you, like you, noisy little creeps like you, we deprive them of their broadband, broadband data connections to the rest of the world. That's what we do. Well, we have to be a little gentler, don't we? And we have to be a little more studied. And what we'd like to do today is to take you a little deeper into the world of e-commerce. I'm going to talk a little bit about trying to better understand the space that we're going to be in and suggest sort of the e-commerce palette for legal education, along with some of its cost and risk. I, I am merely the warm-up for my colleague Professor Wynn here, who is going to take you uh, uh, into a fascinating uh, a tale of the value proposition and re-engineering. The transformative technologies <laughs> are extraordinary. Wireless will remove most of the last vestiges of physicality from the net experience. 
broadband with its speed and persistence will change the very relationship we have with our institutions and with our students as it becomes so simple to extend beyond the physical law school, law school space. I don't know about you, but since DSL got plugged into my home network, it's very hard to leave the home office. The net we're building is truly global. It's opening up fascinating new markets for us and bringing in new competitors. Yet the subtler nuances are perhaps where we should be looking. By about 2005, the dominant area of e-commerce is going to be Europe. The net is going to lose its US centricity. That old adage about the First Amendment merely being a local ordinance will actually come true. Convergence. The most horribly overused term in e-commerce. Who cares, frankly, what it will look like, what World Wrestling Found, uh, Federation stuff will look like when it's enhanced by AOL. But when you look at what's coming to your handheld as we converge data and global positioning and voice, then I think it's exciting. And to me, all this brings ubiquity. The net will be everywhere. Accepted and expected. Worn like underwear. I'm sure that was popular in C50. Now viewing legal education as a service strikes a discordant note amongst those uh, uh, who are uh, tasked with training a learned profession. But service we are just like the profession itself. And both become transformed by e-commerce's e birthing of e-services. The industrial boom was built on the mass production of goods. The internet boom is built on the mass production of services. Growing use of internet technologies in non-tech sectors will change business models throughout the economy, transforming the basic ways that companies make products and serve customers. The net impact is a tremendous wealth creation and destruction. Now, historically, I think we've always looked inwards to define our market and to uh, seek out our competitors. We're surprisingly sanguine about Concord, terrified of Harvard, even Cornell. But to my mind, the real challenge, the real destabilization is going to come from a larger space. Law school space is a relatively small market. I think we have to look beyond that and look beyond it very quickly to see what's happening in broader legal edu education space, pre-JD, post-JD, non-JD. And we have to go beyond that still and look at the broader e-education market. For those players, adding a little layer of law will be a rounding error. So that's my first message of today. That's where the true competition probably lies. <coughs> I heard that the internet might make newspapers obsolete. What are we going to do, the other dead fish asks. Well, as I try and set out a, an e-commerce palette, I'm going to look at pure plays who I think are going to enter our space. I'm going to discuss in my uh, own utopian way some of the barriers faced by those pure plays and suggest maybe they, we have a small window of they face a small window of vulnerability. And then talk a little bit and hope to the, uh, get the, uh, the discussion and, and as, a, as, a, as a preview of what some of Jane's going to say, talk about constructing the click and brick. Business to business legal education services. In the total US economy, real space economy, business to business is worth about $14 trillion. B2C, business to consumer, in that physical space is only worth about $3 trillion. Now, as we move from commerce to e-commerce, that ratio seems so far 
to being preserved. And so I think just about any time you're trying to follow the money, you start by looking at B2B. We're going to see content, uh, content syndicators coming into this market, providing sort of the raw data right down to teaching materials. We're going to see outsourcing plays, admissions, career services, even teaching. And we're going to see a real growth in distance education, total solution providers coming to a law school president near you very soon. At the B2C level, intermediaries are likely to have the most immediate impact, dramatically reducing applicants' information costs and breaking up our geographically based monopolies. Embark.com is a good example of an infomediary coming in and acting uh, between the student applicant and the law school. This aggregation of our offerings will soon begin. Schools will almost inevitably begin to allow, will begin to offer the odd course. You know, the intellectual property course, or the little slice of LLM that's available. Now as soon as the existing law schools start to disaggregate their offerings, that's when you'll have a market for sort of satellite location providers to provide sort of bricks and space kind of ideas for that. You also have consolidators coming into the market who try and cherry pick from different schools and consolidate it into their own JD. Reverse auctions, the Priceline.com model. We've already got it for elective surgery. Why not law school applications? Do you know what your law school would do when contacted by, one, by such an institution, such a play? We already discount our tuition. We're already massive discounters. 40, 50, 60 percent of our students get some kind of discount through scholarships. A reverse auction model is going to look very attractive to some admissions offices as the matriculation date comes along and that message comes in from the infomediary saying, from the reverse auction house saying, we've got an LSAT of X and they're willing to pay Y. So my second message is in the world of pure plays. Net-based law schools, such as Concord, or what I think we're going to see a growing number of for-profit subsidiaries of bricks and mortar on institutions, are a relatively small part of the palette that we have to consider. There are clearly barriers to these pure plates. We have dominant content suppliers in this market. They'll, they'll buy you coffee outside. <laughs> The key to many of the opening e-commerce markets is the idea of disintermediation. Pulling out intermediaries. The net going in there instead, sometimes accompanied by intermediaries. Now disintermediation becomes quite hard, or at least is slowed, when the intermediaries are industry captives. Folks like LSAC, AALS. But that probably won't stop the intermediaries. The accreditation system, while still weakened, while weakened, is still protected by our Supreme Courts. Amongst Silicon Valley venture capitalists, the dominant paradigm has recently shifted from so you want to be a millionaire to survivor. But it's only going to be temporary. I actually believe that we have real value in our bricks. The socialization, the professional companionship, the friendship, the joint learning, those, to my mind, are real values. They're not ones that we articulate particularly well. We tend to take them for granted as law schools continue to subsidize professorial research with the teaching. 
But I believe in that value. I'm not so convinced of value in brand. Maybe if you're Harvard. Maybe if you have the top health law program in the country. <laughs> Beyond that, I'm not quite so sure. We also have a population bulge coming in the application process. I think that's going to make schools feel artificially good about themselves for a couple of years. I wonder whether it might actually cut the other way and some of those folks are going to take these new opportunities. And probably the most important thing is this is an incredibly output dependent service. These cookie cutter lawyers swimming away, the, uh, the ones just out of law school are especially frolicsome, they note. <laughs> For as long as the hiring partners come from the traditional educational process, that's going to form quite an impediment to the new e-service providers. But I hasten to add that I consider those to be temporary impediments. Now as we get to our click and brick plays, and what are we actually going to do? Our basic input services such as admissions, we have to radically re-engineer and move into a vastly more sophisticated, personalization, targeted marketing, e-commerce type of approach. We have to track our, or privacy issues taken care of, we have to track the applicants who come to our schools, websites, see where they're going, what do they like. We have to tease more information out of them. Would you like a t-shirt for visiting our site? And then we have to get really serious about targeted marketing. We have to accept partnerships, consortia and cross-marketing while continuing to differentiate our programs. We cannot do this alone. The e-commerce entities that try and put up real commerce like barriers around each other, around themselves, and not cross-link and cross-navigate and cross-market and play within each other's spaces, those entities shrivel and die. We have to stop getting so conscious of that. We just get into strong pedagogical and curricular reform, robust distributive education for our traditional systems, distant options for LLM part-time evening students, and a huge audience of non-lawyers, professionals who want to learn some law, and back to my bricks. We must continue to re-engineer our physical spaces to dramatize those social and professional areas, establish that value. If we're going to say law school is where you make friends and socialize and learn to interact with other professionals, we must have space that allows people to do that. The costs and risks are immense. You all know the decanal fantasy model. Uh, webcams, a couple of adjuncts and a work-study student who knows HTML. <laughs> I'm sure Jane will lead us into an e-commerce model. Process-driven investment in teachers and technologists, advanced technology facilities, content generation, marketing, strategic partnerships, 24 by 7 support. You all have that now? <laughs> Radical re-engineering. The payback? Well, in the short term, I think it's worth doing just because I think we'll make it much, we'll, we'll confirm the value, increase the value proposition for our traditional students. Midterm, I think it gives us a shot at survival. Dan Hunter, I understand, called me a geektopian the other day. Maybe I am. Midterm. Utopia, incidentally, is a, is a word that Australians have no use for until they emigrate. <laughs> Long-term, is click and bick sustainable when faced with the explosion of consumer acceptance of these services and the pure plays efficiencies? I don't pretend to know. Well, I'll leave you with, and, and you know, we're not the, as, 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 as God's financial advisors say to one another as he looks uh, honestly out, well, this hasn't turned a profit yet either. <laughs> but for now, let me give you some guidance as to how you can spot when things are coming towards you. How you know that e-commerce is in your future. Number 10, prof cams installed in all faculty offices. <laughs> Number 9, the dean subscribes to Wired and Red Herring and posts on Slashdot. <laughs> 
Number eight, the faculty meeting agenda has the tax professors explaining the ABA's temporary distance learning guidelines. Number seven, Oracle puts a banner ad on your website. Number six, the Chris Services Director is replaced by the Vice President for order fulfillment. The LLM faculty buys lunch for IT. A venture capitalist is awarded an honorary JD. Candidates for teaching positions are asked to give job talks in front of a blue screen. The library is renamed the Content Development Division. And the number one sign that e-commerce is in your future, every morning the Dean searches for Concord on www.comfailures.com. Thank you very much. Do you want to take any questions while we're changing? Be happy to. <coughs> you have one in the back. Yes. When you talk about uh, name brand attractions for law schools, uh, I don't think you gave enough weight to the name brand of the network you get by going to law school. Oh, I, I, I totally agree. Um, I think there are, my, my, I guess what I, I tend to see, uh, Brands like Notre Dame, for example. I think it's somebody you can call. Which, have, which, but I mean, Notre Dame, I think, is a good example of which has an incredible alumni association, uh, and so on. But I mean, I, I look at places like that as, as branding that tends not to be uh, 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 pulled out of the law schools, but probably as a product of a sports team. I'm, 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 I'm skeptical about any brand that we're really generating from within the law school part of the institution. Apart from a very few. Okay. Yes. The the only grail for the student is the job of the big city law firm. Like one of the students is not gonna have to graduate today. Good. Okay. The, the, the question is, uh, the, the, the holy grail for the, uh, the student at the moment is the job with the big city law firm, and that is not going to happen uh, at the moment with, uh, with a graduate from distance education. Um, I, I beg your pardon? Or in the near future. Or in the near future. Um, I'm, I guess I, my question on that is, I mean, I agree with you, but what is the near future? I mean, I firmly believe in this is extremely output dependent. Um, but I think that that probably only has another uh, five years of real life in it. I'm cutting into Jane's time. Oh, okay. And there's your mic. Yeah, I would say I would say the question of how information technology is going to transform the legal profession is a unique uh, opportunity for legal education to contribute and participate. Because if you think about how people in higher education would study the question of how information technology might transform the delivery of legal services and how the law firms working with consulting firms might study the problem, I think that you can see that, that there are no easy answers for the question of how law practice will be transformed. And I think that's something that we need to be engaged in. I have to say, um, if I had had any idea that Nick was going to be so witty or have so many entertaining slides, I would have asked him to go second. Uh, <laughs> I usually, I usually start out at, when I talk at e-commerce events, I start out by explaining that I'm a bankruptcy law professor so that people will lower their expectations. So, okay, so um, I'm going to talk about re-engineering. I'm, I'm really a business law professor and I work a lot in electronic commerce law and so um, because I hang out with people who are undergoing re-engineering in their organizations, that's how I got tagged to talk about re-engineering. The slides from this presentation will be exported to the Cali website, so you don't need to write these down now. I tried to think, if you wanted to do further reading of the most helpful things I could point you to, the first one is a book called Information Rules by Carl Shapiro and Hal Varian. It's very clearly written. It's written for managers. It's not written for lawyers, but it's written, uh, the editors really worked on it, and it's in... It's very easy to read. It gives you really powerful analytic tools for understanding what's happening in the economy. Um, I have a, a PhD student who's writing her dissertation on e-commerce stuff, and she read a pile of like a dozen of those books. I call them airport bookstore books. And afterwards, she came back and she said, you're right. The Shapiro and Darian book was the only one worth reading. 
Um, reengineering the Corporation is a classic. If you want to know about reengineering, you really do need to go back and read that book. That's also a fun and easy read. E-Business, A Roadmap for Success, is a little paperback book by Addison Wesley that explains things like enterprise resource management and customer relationship management applications, if you want to know the guts of how they work. There are two recent articles in the Harvard Business Review. One is Hammer updating his reengineering to take account of the way it works now. And the other one is Getting Real About Virtual Commerce that's just kind of a thumbnail sketch of some important trends in e-commerce. And finally, because lawyers like to learn from case studies, in Business 2.0, which on their website is business2.com, they in the June issue they had case studies. So they read like law school cases, um, you know, reported opinions, five who get it, five who don't. I think it's always useful to focus on the people who've bollocksed it up. Okay, what is re-engineering? Re-engineering, you have to define the value proposition for the customer. It's all about becoming customer-centered. Um, and putting to one side all your preconceptions about the nature of your market, the nature of your organization, and the nature of what you're providing your customer. Then you have to identify the processes that will allow you to deliver that value. And you have to start with an open mind about thinking what those processes are. Um, and the little uh, article in the Harvard Business Review is very clear about explaining that processes, re-engineering processes don't come into being by themselves, they don't come into being painlessly and they don't come into being without a lot of resistance, uh, political backstabbing, general carnage in the existing bureaucracy. So you have to make someone in the organization a, a process owner, you have to give them some traction and some leverage for forcing changes through. Um, and you have to cut away the dead wood, which is fairly horrific and painful. Um, and then when you come out on the other side of all of this, either you've tanked the corporation or you've created a learning organization. And how many people did you hear about Hershey? Hershey didn't have any candy on the shelves. There was no Hershey candy on the shelves at Halloween. Did you know about that one? They, they boxed up their re-engineering. So, you know, heads rolled and Hershey will survive, but they learned their lesson. Okay. Um, now, I went, to, uh, I went to law school when critical legal studies was in fashion. You can now date me. Um, and uh, when I was reading the Hammer and Stanton piece in the Harvard Business Review, this sentence jumped out uh, from the page at me. It says, reengineering has allowed executives to see through the surface structure of their organizations to the underlying purpose, the delivery of value to customers in a way that creates profit for shareholders. And I thought, it's deconstruction. Okay, now, how many people thought critical legal studies was an effete, self-referential, pointless exercise? <laughs> That's the conclusion I came to. I go to conferences where managers are struggling to understand technology. They're struggling to understand its implications for their markets and for their organizations. E-commerce is not about empowerment. E-commerce is not about enhancing strategic competitive operations. It's about fear. People are scared witless. It's traumatic. And so the idea of deconstruction was that somehow there would be this sort of Marxian reorientation of power. It's happening in the business sector today. People are suffering and they're really frightened. So, I mean, in higher education, it's like, where is it? You can hear a pin drop, right? I mean, people have guaranteed lifetime employment. In China, we call that the iron rice bowl, okay? <laughs> Okay, what's the information revolution? The, the Shapiro and Varian book is a superb explanation to the information revolution to everybody who hasn't been following engineering and technology developments in telecommunications and uh, computers for the last 25 years. Okay, we all know, you know, Moore's Law and Metcalfe's Law, communication and information process costs are falling faster than other costs, so if you can find a way to position yourself to take advantage of that, you will be able to kill your competition. Disintermediation to reintermediation. Nick talked a lot about that. We are the intermediaries that are being disintermediated, and we will only be present for the reintermediation if we have reinvented ourselves. Network effects, from many to few, unless open public standards define networks. I actually shared a cabin from the airport with the guy at Oracle, and he said, you know, Microsoft isn't the only one doing it. Okay? How many people know what the percentage of market share Oracle now has for relational databases that power e-commerce? They're getting up to Microsoft-like numbers. And Shapiro and Varian explained very clearly why that is a characteristic of the information economy. The only way to create an end run around it is to have open public standards. Read Cali. Okay? That if institutions don't put their weight behind collaborative open processes, it will be survival of the fittest, and most of us aren't going to like the way that comes out. The great information revolution uh, global land grab is now underway. That architecture is being put in place. It's taking shape now. And if you're not a player, you're not going to be, you're not going to be um, present when the, when the um, 
final allocations have been decided. This is the final thing is an actual quote that I read in an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, in about 1996 or 97. And they're actually talking to one of the editors at the Dow Jones organization, the parent organization, and they said, you know, all of us media people look at the internet and we say, do you want someone to eat your own, do you want to eat your own young or do you want someone else to do it for you? I mean, and that's what we're facing in legal education. You can't say, I think we're doing a good job at this law school and I don't want to deal with this because I feel confident about the quality of the product we're delivering. I mean, someone's eating your lunch, if that's your approach. Um, and then finally, uh, a revolution is not a dinner party. That's a quote from Chairman Mao, by the way. Uh, <laughs> this is, this is uh, a quote from uh, the book. I've kind of reconstructed it. Shapiro and Marion point out over and over again how people manage to just run their organizations right into the ground in the face of the challenges that the information revolution poses. And one of the most common mistakes people make is they try to maximize the protection of their current franchise. Does that sound like what we're doing in legal education? Shall we, shall we thank the folks at the ABA uh, accreditation for that? Um, maximize the value of the services to the end user. That is the only way you can survive because the information revolution powerfully decenters administrative processes in favor of the end user. And if legal education doesn't start focusing on the end user, um, then uh, I can tell you what's going to happen is you know who's delivering legal instructional content over the internet without the ABA accreditation uh, issues to, to trip them up is business schools. Our competitors are putting the, the machinery in place right now today to annihilate us and our regulators don't feel concerned. Okay, so what's the value proposition in legal education? This is how you do re-engineering. You say like, hey, let's just like start with an open mind. Like what's the value proposition? Okay, now you can define this as broadly or narrowly as you want. You could say satisfied law students. I, I teach at a very expensive private school and believe me that figures very prominently in our unstated premise about what the value proposition is. Um, I think that that's obviously a catastrophically uh, short-sighted statement of the overall uh, vision. Is the uh, value proposition satisfied lawyers? That's Nick's point about calling career services as the order fulfillment department. I think that's similarly, especially if you're vulnerable like private education is with regard to the expenses that it charges, the, the price of tuition, you're very vulnerable to catering to the legal profession as the customer. But I think ultimately, what does it mean that we're in higher education? What does it mean that we're tenured faculty members as opposed to salaried managers? We have an obligation to focus on the public interest, and I think the public interest of legal education and the only plausible justification for our institutional structure surviving is that we work towards the rule of law, we work to create empowered democracies, and if we don't do it, believe me, the business schools can do what we're doing better. So what's the surface structure of legal education today? Remember, that's what re-engineering is. It's about peeling away the surface structure and looking underneath to the real values. Okay, so the surface structure is like doctrinal, you know. When I talk to my colleagues at my law school, they say, well, you know, should we add some new courses? And I think, I don't think that's what we're, we're trying to do. Another way that you could characterize the surface structure is you could say, well, you know, faculty and staff have certain relationships to each other. Faculty and students have certain relationships to each other. Tenured versus adjunct. These are existing hierarchical bureaucratic categories that are the kind of distinctions that the re-engineering process sweeps away. And I think that, I mean, when I got, when I got you know, the, bitten by the technology bug, uh, several years ago, I made the decision that I had to learn to live in a world without tenure. And so I'm prepared for the reorganization of legal education to mean that, that my performance will be evaluated continuously and, um, and there will be consequences for failure to perform. On the other hand, I do have to say that I am waiting to be bought out. I'm not surrendering tenure without a, uh, without a compensation package. <laughs> okay, so... Um, so psychologically, I'm prepared. Okay. Um, identifying the process. Uh, okay, now this is like, uh, Nick and I had talked about the possibility of having a, um, having a uh, document camera and soliciting comments from the audience. And if we have time in the Q&A period, we could do that. This is just like a wild guess, a wild stab at like, so like, what's this alternative parallel universe that we might live in if we, can, if we complete this re-engineering successfully and it's still us and not all of our adjunct faculty that populate law schools? Um, identifying the process. We're, you have to talk about value to the customer, which is, according to my uh, assertion, the public, the American public that needs to understand their rights and obligations in a democracy. Um, 
What would be a way of delivering that, making you know, a strong democracy where people understand their rights and obligations? As a first step, I would say, how does, how does the public experience law? Start with that as your basic premise and say, let's make sure that when a, um, when a human being comes into contact with the legal system, they are dealt with in a manner that seems rational and responsive to their concerns. So I would, just as a first guess, I would say, think about the delivery of legal services to the public is your baseline and try and organize a legal education that makes sense in that context. Now it's like, well, but like, what happened, what happened to all the courses we have today? Where's the substance? So I'd say, I don't know, I mean, you know, you could teach, you could teach contract law and torts and uh, securities regulation as modules inside a practice course. That's just a suggestion. You can say it stinks, I don't care. <laughs> so, okay. Um, Okay, now, in terms of identifying the process, one of the things that I think is very interesting about looking at the delivery of legal services as broadly construed as possible, when you look at the technologies that are driving the re-engineering process in the private sector, there are some very specific applications and technologies that are changing the way corporations relate to their customers. One of them is customer relationship management applications, and one of them is enterprise resource management applications. And I don't think... I don't think it makes sense for me to try and go into a huge explanation of this right now. Some people may already know what's going on. If these are, are terms that you've sort of seen bandied about, but you don't have a very concrete understanding of what they do, that book called e-business, what is it called, e-business, um, oops, whatever it is, e-business uh, manager's guide or something. That is a, it has a chapter on customer relationship management. It has a chapter on enterprise resource management. So that's a very good, uh, simple uh, resource that you can turn to. Customer relationship management software, if you're not familiar with it, it's what tells the person in the corporation dealing with you whether you're a valued customer or not. I don't know if you've heard the metrics, but the 10% of customers generate 90% of corporations' profits. Um, you can see it in the airlines. I, I fly a lot now, so I'm Advantage Platinum. So Advantage, the upper class Advantage people account for 90% of the profits of American Airlines. And... Um, how can I tell that that matters? I, I called up a uh, reservation on Travelocity, and then I went home, and I left my computer on overnight, and the following morning I called up to buy the ticket. Now, why did I buy the ticket with the phone? Because I, I spent a lot of time studying e-commerce. I do not buy stuff over the Internet if there is a telephone I can call. Why? Because it's middleware. Does everybody know what middleware is? The integration between the back office and the web front end? An astonishing large number of organizations have screwed up their middleware. So I never enter orders over the web if I have an alternative. Okay, so I called up American Airlines to purchase my airplane ticket with a human being. And he said, he quoted a price to me that was slightly higher than the one that was on my screen from the night before. And I said, oh, I'm looking at my browser from yesterday and the price was lower yesterday. He put me on hold. He came back and he said, the ticket's been issued at the lower price. Now, did you notice I didn't ask for that? Okay, so that's what businesses are doing is they're being able to distinguish between, now another one is like, I teach, I teach payment systems and so my law students and I spend a lot of time talking about our relationships with our banks. And I get the same kind of treatment from my bank. I mean, I call up and complain about something and they grovel obsequiously, right? When my students call up their banks to complain about something, what do they say? They say like, well, piss off, you know, there's other banks. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we all know the end result of this kind of thing. Enterprise resource management software, in essence, it's not that difficult to understand what's happening. Corporations formally ran a lot of different applications on a lot of different systems. If you do SAP or PeopleSoft, how many law schools are part of universities that are now mired in a just desperate quagmire with PeopleSoft? Okay, this is the downside of re-engineering, is it can go just horrifically wrong and then it's like, no exit, you know, okay? Um, okay, so if you're able to implement enterprise resource management applications, what they do is they create a unified database of all information within the organization, and on top of that unified database are different applications. So you have the same database for, you know, paying the gardener who cuts the lawn at the law school and the student's grades and whether the students have paid their bills. All that stuff goes into the same database. The applications sit on top of an integrated database for the entire organization, and then you can access those applications from an unlimited number of platforms like your Palm Pilot or your cell phone or your laptop or a terminal. And through access controls, you say, you know, you're just a law professor. You're not entitled to find out how much the gardener gets paid. 
Okay, so that's the idea of enterprise resource management is that information that's relevant for decision making should be available anywhere, anytime, based on need. It's a great concept, but you know, it's pretty hard to execute. Okay, so um, the thing that I think is most striking when you look at these technologies in legal education is that we only apply it to administration. We don't apply it to the learning process. If we migrate legal educational content online, we have the potential to study student learning processes and make learning efficient and to give real value, to learn how students learn, to adapt the way we deliver content, to profile students' strengths and weaknesses, like Nick said, subject, of course, to the Berkeley Amendment and all of their privacy rights, uh, Buckley Amendment. Okay. That's what's missing in legal education today, is it's only the bean counters in universities that are doing this re-engineering. We haven't migrated the actual delivery of educational services into this environment so that we can customize the learning experience and make it more powerful for the um, students. Okay, now, uh, the problem with re-engineering is, of course, it creates carnage in the hierarchy because you're trying to assign new rights and responsibilities to people who felt very comfortable with their old rights and responsibilities, and so people have to have power to force people to accept changes that are not, uh, not ones that they would choose voluntarily. How are you going to make stakeholders process owners in higher education? I mean, I always get a lot of laughs when I talk to people in the private sector, and I say, so, like, like how far do you think you'd get if, if all your relevant players had guaranteed lifetime employment? Okay? So, how are you going to do this in higher education? Well, you know, instead of giving people endowed chairs for subjects, you could go out and solicit corporate endowments for process owners. Um, you could substitute uh, content development for scholarly publication. I think every single person in this room has understood for like years and years and years that this is the crucial missing piece in the puzzle, why legal education can't get its act together. There have to be new metrics for measuring the effectiveness of new content. You have to find a way to evaluate people's competence and reward them for competence, which becomes feasible if you migrate legal education online, because then you can monitor the data flows and evaluate them critically. Yeah, okay. So, now how about this? This is the one that I thought was pretty cool. It's like, okay, so you can't abolish tenure. Maybe you can. Uh, you can't abolish tenure. So, like, auction off new courses to the highest bidder. Let faculty members cash in their summer research grant chips to get the courses they really want. Or assign them by lottery. Or abolish tenure. Like I said, you know, I'm philosophical about that, but it's going to have to have, come with a uh, nice uh, compensation package. Okay. Now, ultimately, the thing that's missing in legal education is the break-even point. How can you calculate the break-even point? Because what do law schools do with their revenues today? My understanding, I'm not a dean, my understanding is that most law school revenues today are tied up with scholarships and faculty salaries. Faculty salaries is like a whole revolution that hasn't taken place yet. What are you going to do? Like, not give students scholarships for a decade while you re-engineer your school? The the only way I can see out of that particular bind is, as Nick was pointing out, new markets, new revenues have to be discovered and tapped to create new revenues to make re-engineering possible because it's going to be horrifically expensive, not just unpleasant for the human beings living through it, but in fact, you know, like a root canal, you pay for it too. Okay, so um, that's the only way I can see out of that particular conundrum, but it becomes possible if you think of legal education as building empowered democracy. Um, and then ultimately, after you've survived all that, you've created a learning organization. Okay, so that's the payoff in terms of substance at the end of this. You could engage students, lawyers, clients, and the public in uh, the process of articulating what it is that people need to be uh, taught and need to understand. Okay, now, one of the points about network effects is that once we have migrated the delivery of legal educational services into an online environment, there's going to be a very powerful tendency for there to be just one U.S. law school. That's the way the technology works. We as human beings can intervene in the unfolding of the technological processes and try and produce different outcomes. There could be a consortium of law schools, which is why I think Cali is so important. Uh, basic legal services could be delivered through law firms instead of law schools. I used to do law and society stuff before I started learning software stuff, and it's, it's, a, it's a brute fact of the delivery of legal services in the United States that like 70 to 80 percent of all potential demand for legal services is absolutely not met. When you go up from legal services corporation or law school clinics providing to the indigent, until you hit the point where people can actually afford to pay for legal services. That's the American working class and the American middle class. And law schools could meet that demand without inconveniencing any of those people that, you know, place our graduates. Now, logically, 
okay, we can dispute the economics. Um, logically, as Nick said, it's global. Information technology is creating a global environment. So it's like, no, it's like not one U.S. law school. It's one global law school or consortium of law schools. Okay, now, but in fact, why is it a law school? Why isn't it a legal services delivery vehicle? Okay, now I think that there are people who are thinking along these lines. They're not in legal education and they're not in LexisNexis and Westlaw because LexisNexis and Westlaw have a channel conflict problem, right? If LexisNexis and Westlaw target that particular model, their clients are going to stop paying for their services today, okay? And they're never going to get from here to there. If you look at the nolo.com website, I think that there are people who are thinking in these terms and I think that there are people who don't have channel conflict problems that are going to be doing some very interesting things in uh, the near future. Okay, the final question, like I've said, you know, it's like, you know, what did, what did Churchill say? Blood, tears, toil, and sweat? I can't remember. Anyway, so it's going to be like <sighs> dreadful. Um, I can't imagine it's going to happen unless there's like a major downturn in the stock market and the economy and people are forced to make painful decisions. I don't think re-engineering is going to start in legal education unless there are some really profound crises, some survival issues at some institutions. Once it... What, what, what you can observe in the private sector and businesses is that once somebody gets it right, once somebody puts the pieces together and starts using re-engineering and e-business technologies effectively, it creates a baseline that other institutions have to move to very rapidly in a catch-up mode. And I just don't know where the, the initial impetus is going to come from, but that would be the scenario, is that somebody's going to find a way to integrate it and put the pieces in place, and then the rest of us will have to try and catch up. So why bother, given that, given that it's not going to happen in the next 18 months, and it's going to be horrifically complicated, and that there's going to be some clear winners and losers uh, among those who are going to try and find a way out of that maze. I think that the essential uh, reason that we have to fight for this is the point that I made about the rule of law. If one of the ambiguities in the electronic environment is that the classic distinction between oral communications and written communications ceases to be terribly meaningful, defining the mapping on existing concepts to new media is an exercise of power. And if faculty control the migration of legal educational content online, then digital content will replace our paper textbooks, okay? We can, we can create more powerful learning experiences in the online environment, and then we can bring students into face-to-face -face meetings with us, and we can focus on critical judgment, on thinking about institutions in thought-provoking, probing, authority-challenging ways. If business interests control the migration, then the digital content will replace the oral portion of legal education today. And the digital content will take the place of the professor. And there's not going to be a lot of critical thinking going on. So I think that that's why as faculty members, as members of higher educational institutions, we really have to fight to remain in control of these processes. Thank you very much. Yes. Questions? Take questions. Yeah. It's not. Yes. Don't know what advice you have for the ABA. <laughs> Reengineering? <laughs> uh, what advice for the ABA? I, wake up and smell the coffee? I, I don't know. I mean, um, uh, are you a representative of the ABA? <laughs> Maybe they should. Maybe they should do lunch with Nolo. I don't know. Uh, that's 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 a political question that we'd have to like talk about in the hallway and think of ways to like raise our consciousness. Are there any other questions? Yes, up in the back. Sometimes I think the concern for the conquer experience is somewhat misplaced. Now, when I look at the analogy of the itself, over time, our attendance has been more fully attended. substitute for coming together, you would think how would it be to the example where you could do that. On that other hand, that really isn't happening. I mean, we're coming more together. So I, I can't see that a conquer truly uh, is going to be drawing uh, people that far apart. And I, I wonder if really the assessment is made by the president himself who said it's really a niche. 
uh, that he's trying to come on to, uh, the folks who wouldn't come to law school any time. But I guess I just, I don't see that it's quite so all depressing as I think sometimes we're, we're hearing. Okay, so the question, if I could just try and restate the question. The question was, um, if people who understood how to use technology were really fully taking advantage of it, this would be a virtual conference instead of a face-to-face -face conference. And uh, Concord is a niche player, and it doesn't really have that many revolutionary implications for legal education as a whole. So our, our concern's a little bit overdone. So I'll let Nick answer that. I think, I think that goes like <laughs> and then, and then, And then anything that Nick doesn't cover, I'll add. <laughs> I'd go back to uh, uh, the uh, statement I made about the uh, the different layers of I've got a uh, okay. uh, different layers of players in this market. Um, I think Concord is a niche mark uh, is is a niche player uh, at the moment. Um, I think the real players are going to be coming in from outside. Um, I think if you have an uh, educational e-services system that you set up. And clearly those are being set up at the moment. Those are the players who are, the, the, I mean, the, those tanks have already rolled. I mean, the, the, that, that's a, that city has already been uh, uh, surrounded. Now, once that infrastructure is set up, layering on different subjects, you know, until they get to L, is going to be relatively simple, relatively cheap. And that's, I think, when... It, what you're going to see is you're going to see lots of little sort of niches, or what appear to be niches. The Concords, some, you know, some, whoever buys Harcourt Brace, what's going to happen there? And the question is, will we... What, what are we going to be doing in three years' time when suddenly you look out and all those little pieces have popped their heads out of the ground and maybe someone comes along and says, hey, let's aggregate them. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 call, I, I agree with you, but I don't agree with, uh, 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 I don't think that uh, because it's a niche player that it shouldn't be an incredible amount of concern for us. Okay, yeah, um, I, I, I'm, I'm in agreement with Nick's comments and I just add to them in a few ways. I have a colleague named Walter Efros at American University who says the most important thing that happens in conferences is the hallway conversations. So people will continue to come to conferences to have the hallway conversations. And I think that the point that I'm making here is that electronic media doesn't have any clear and obvious application to what we were doing before electronic media existed. And so there's a whole redefining and reinterpreting process that goes along. And that's the point about deconstruction. Who has the power to reinterpret? And I think that that's something that we need to remain engaged in is deciding in what context can we eliminate the, excuse me, <coughs> can we <coughs> eliminate the face-to-face -face interaction and replace it with electronic media? And there are no obvious and simple answers. So, so the fact that people are still willing to fly to Chicago and attend a physical conference is important information that needs to be analyzed. With regard to whether or not Columbia, uh, is that Concord? Concord. Oof, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no. Concord the rumor about the merger, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, the, the, the question about whether or not it's a niche player. I think it's very important to look in the economy at which sectors of the economy have been most traumatized by sort of e-business technologies. What is it? It's like brokerage firms, financial services generally, realtors, uh, uh, travel. Things where the transaction itself had already been standardized and automated before the internet came along and facilitated more ubiquitous participation in the transactions. If you look at legal services, um, the, legal, the market for legal services, and you compare that with, say, for example, the computer reservation systems by the airlines were developed, you know, starting in the late 1960s. That's one of the reasons that once the internet interface was put on, that the travel industry has been just most transformed or devastated, or however you want to think it, depending on whether you're an employee, right? Um, depending on how you want to think about it, it has been most transformed because they had 30 years of re-engineering work behind them when they put that internet front end on. When you look at the delivery of legal services, this goes back to the question about, you know, placing law students and jobs. Legal services is a sector of the economy that is relatively untouched by the things that I was talking about, enterprise, <clears throat> resource management, customer relationship management. We, we were early adopters of specific technologies like online legal research and automation of document production. 
we are late adopters with regard to the technologies that provide the sort of synthesis and integration of those operations and allow the top level management to see the, the structure and the relative efficiencies and inefficiencies of the overall operation. So if legal education appears to be kind of out of it in terms of IT, it's because the legal profession is kind of out of it in terms of IT. And so that's something, again, what I was saying is that legal education needs to participate in the, in the process of migrating legal services into this environment so that they contribute to democracy and not just to the profitability of existing law firms. Is that, without, without disagreeing about your point about uh, Concord being a niche player. great place to end off. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Pleasure.